The Lord be with you. <laughs> Good morning. I'll greet you in the name of our Savior Jesus on this beautiful day that God has given to us that we can be in here in his house, gathered around his word and sacrament. And good morning to those of you online. I'm assuming there's more of you watching online than there is in this building right now. So uh, as a pastor, I am a practical person. I knew when I saw the weather forecast for today that I, I knew our numbers were going to uh, take a hit. I'm happy that you are here this morning. And uh, for those of you uh, watching online, uh, enjoy that cup of coffee, enjoy church in your jammies, uh, but please make sure you're turning your external devices off and that you're concentrating on us here this morning. Okay, so I just got a couple of announcements here. Um, I guess the biggest one is after second service today, the plan is to take down all of the, the Christmas stuff because we, it has to be done before next Sunday because uh, the Epiphany uh, season will be starting. And so that'll be taking place after uh, second service today if you feel so inclined uh, to join us. Uh, we also need to point out that your offering envelopes are back there in your mail slots and that uh, uh, dartball is going to start up on Thursday, but I don't think we know where yet. So if you want to play dartball this year, uh, feel free to talk to Todd and he will let you know where that's going to be. Uh, when it comes to birthdays and anniversaries, we just have uh, Emily's birthday again, again today, so happy birthday to you. And then the last thing I just want to mention, it should come as a surprise to no one in this room, that I will be off this week. It is my tradition to take the first week of January off as my post-holiday sabbatical. Uh, next Sunday, the Right Reverend President Barry Hinkey will be here preaching. So I hope that you will be here. Uh, please don't stay home because I'm not going to be here because Barry is awesome and uh, his message for you will be terrific. So uh, I always love it when he comes here to preach because when the district president is in the house, that's always a blessing. So uh, anything I'm forgetting or neglecting? Okay, then let's go ahead and go to our opening hymn here this morning, uh, and God bless our worship together here today.
congregational, please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. The glory is of His only Son, from the Father, full of grace and truth. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fit. Great is our Lord, and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear Him. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
Lord be with you. We pray. Almighty God, you have poured into our lights the true light of your incarnate word. Grant that this light may shine forth in our lives. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated for the readings. The Old Testament reading for the second Sunday after Christmas is from 1 Kings chapter 3. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand bird offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, You've shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David my father, although I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give, give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, Because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself a long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Then he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and peace offerings and made a feast for all his servants. This is the word of the Lord. To us a child is born, to us a son is given, and, the and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Sing to the Lord a new song. The epistle this morning is from Ephesians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. We now stand to sing the Alleluia in verse and remain standing for the words of the Holy Gospel. Holy 
Gospel according to St. Luke, the second chapter. The child Jesus grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey, but then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances, and when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. But he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We are seated for the sermon hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The text for your sermon this morning, the biblical basis for our thoughts together here today, are the words of the Gospel lesson, which I read a few moments ago, the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 2, beginning with verse 41. We begin your sermon today with a story. I read about a pastor who some years ago, as was his custom, invited the kids to come up for a kids talk obviously this was before COVID and he sat down on a step like we have here and the regulars quickly gathered around him and they were sitting on the floor and, you know trying to get his trying to sit near him 
And then there was a new family there at that church that day, and they had a little guy. And he sort of walked up, but he wouldn't get with the group because he was new. He just sort of looked at the pastor and stood off at, you know, 10, 15 feet and wouldn't come any closer. And so the pastor figured, well, if he's a little nervous or whatever, I'll just start. So he started talking his children's sermon. And as he's talking, this little kid, this visitor, starts inching closer and closer and closer until he's standing right next to the pastor while he's talking. And while the pastor was continuing to talk, suddenly this little guy just reached his arms around him and gave him a big old hug right around his neck. And of course the congregation did at that point what a congregation would be expected to do at that point. They all went, aww. So after the, the, the hug, he then uh, you know, let go a little bit, but then he, uh, he put his little tiny hand inside the pastor's big hand. And, and, and this pastor had big hands. And yeah, I think mine are pretty normal, maybe even a little small for someone my height. But there was a few years ago we had a visitor here, and he had hands like this, you know. And so he's coming out and, and uh, good morning, pastor. And he goes in, and uh, immediately after the handshake, there were like five cracks and crinkles and pops in here. And for the rest of the day, because I, I, I mean, he really went at it, okay. So here you have this little kid putting his hand in this pastor's big hand. And the pastor was thinking, maybe I should change my, sermon, my kid's sermon here to talk about the, the little hand and the big hand here. Because the Bible often associates our being in the hands of God, right? It's one of the, the best things that could happen to us. Even according to Luke, the last words Jesus spoke when he's on the cross were, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, because the hands of God, particularly the right hand, are seen as a symbol of his power, artists often use a gigantic hand as a symbol of creation. And you might see that on stained glass windows, especially in older churches. They also depict a huge open hand as a symbol of God's love and acceptance. And finally, like the ad for a <clears throat> certain insurance company, Artists occasionally show the care and protection and safety provided by God with a picture of us or the entire world here in his hands. And I assume you're all familiar with the song. He's got the whole world in his hands. So if you're wondering why I'm starting here with this today, since we're talking about Jesus in the temple for the first time, I was thinking about this because that, that, that tiny hand of that little kid engulfed by the big hand of the pastor reminds us that no human artist or no human period could have come up with the idea that the most significant reach God would make ever into this world would begin not with gigantic hands of God the Father, but instead the tiny hands of a baby born in a manger in little old Bethlehem. Every so often, I'll read or hear somebody, you know, say, you know, the, everything in the Bible is made up. Somebody just wrote it. It's all fiction. Well, what person would think of this, you know? No human being could have imagined that those same hands, that those same hands that would one day be nailed to a cross would have started their mission as an infant in a manger. It took the imagination and the planning of God himself to come up with that idea. Now, I read about another pastor who had a favorite way to explain or describe the indescribable and unexplainable God. And I've always loved this quote, and I may have shared this with you before. But this pastor liked to say regarding God's qualities, the fact that he's a triune God, three persons but one God, but three persons but one God, or the fact that Jesus is present here in, with, and under uh, this, this bread and wine over here. This pastor used to say, I don't understand everything I know about that. And I really like that quote. Because we know these things are true. They're in the Bible. We know that God is a triune God. We know that Jesus is present here, but we don't understand it. So that pastor used to say, I don't understand everything I know about that. And when you read this Sunday's gospel, 
It strikes me that these words were probably a frequent reaction of Mary and Joseph to their special son because there were a lot of things they didn't understand. But they knew this was God's son. Although I think they forgot a lot, and I think they forgot in the gospel reading today. So let's go to the gospel reading. The gospel lesson begins with an example of the fact that Joseph and Mary were religious. They had faith, and they observed the Jewish rituals and occasions. Because Luke tells us that every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. And this was not required. That may sound strange to you because obviously at, at Christmas everybody's here and at Easter everybody's here. And, and for them, Passover was the, the high festival of their, of their year. But it was the rules in those days that if you lived in Jerusalem, you had to go to the temple every year for Passover. But if you lived outside of Jerusalem and lived any distance away, you didn't have to do it every year. They said you just needed to do it once in your life. But Joseph and Mary, it says here, went every year. So apparently many among Jesus' friends and family also practiced that, and they went as a large group. And of course, he wanted to travel in groups in those days. I mean, the Bible doesn't spend a lot of time talking about the crime rate in Palestine in the first century, but there was a crime rate, and there were people that would rob you if you were uh, off by yourself, and so by traveling in numbers, that meant you were safer. So when Jesus was 12 years old, he went along on the trip, and he took it upon himself to, st to stay behind at the temple when the rest of the gang departed. Now, there are some who've tried to argue that, that this is an example of a sin, that Jesus did a wrong thing here, but he didn't do a wrong thing because he did what his heavenly Father wanted him to do. And I don't know if you folks read the Lutheran Hour on, online or, or listen to it on the radio or online, but today they had a, a rerun, frankly, uh, and Gregory Seltz was uh, uh, delivering the message today, and he made an interesting point, I thought, because he was talking about waiting and how people wait at the holidays. They wait for the presents, and they wait for the gatherings, and they wait for the holidays. And he was saying that Jesus had to do a lot of waiting because from the time he was in the manger to the time he began his ministry was 30 years. And so at the age of 12, he was kind of like, I want to get started here. And so he went to the temple, and he started teaching. But Mary and Joseph and the gang, they went on their way back to Nazareth, and because of the number of people involved, his parents did not notice his absence until they had traveled for a whole day. And, of course, this text always reminds me of the movie Home Alone, that somebody counted wrong, you know. And it is likely that individual families would spread out during the day, the children here, the adults there, but they'd gather together again at night. And so Mary and Joseph found themselves... Well, where'd Jesus go? And there, I don't think there's any parent that has any trouble imagining the mix of worry and anger that came over Mary and Joseph when they could not find Jesus in the group. I'm sure that for all of us parents here, for any parents who might be watching online here this morning, we've all probably been in a situation where we've, we've wondered, where is our son or daughter? And if it's only like for five or ten seconds in the mall or uh, at a parade or, 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 or an amusement park, those are, that's a really long period of time. And if you have a good memory, you will recall that I've told you once from this pulpit about the time that I lost Matthew. Now, Matthew probably doesn't remember this, but this was when Matthew was two or three. He wasn't very old. Uh, he and I were home alone. Erica and Christopher were at where Erica used to give piano lessons, and I was, I had my computer in my lap, I was working on something for you guys, and I suddenly realized it was quiet, too quiet, and if you're a parent, you know what I mean, right, because usually you expect a certain background noise with your kids, and when there is no noise, you're like, okay, something's going on, right, something's wrong. So I'm like, well, where's Matthew? So I went in his room. He wasn't in his room. And then we had a second bedroom that we called the playroom because that's where we put all their toys and stuff, and he wasn't in there. And I looked in, uh, in, in my room, and I looked, uh, and this, we didn't live in a big house in those days, so it didn't take long for me to figure out that he didn't seem to be in any rooms. So then I went in the backyard. He wasn't there. I went in the front yard. He wasn't there. And so now I'm like, so now I'm looking under beds, and I'm looking in closets, and I'm looking you know, in every you know, crevice of the house, and I still can't find him. 
And I got to the point where, oh dear, now I have to call Erica. And, you know, we'd had Christopher for a few years. I had proven my bona fides in terms of I was, I was, I was a good dad. I hadn't lost a child before. You know, I changed diapers. I you know, could get the car seat in and out of the car, you know. But. So I called Erica, and I said, and she's like, what's going on? And I said, well, thought you might want to know. I can't find Matthew. <laughs> I will not give you her reaction. I will just say that uh, she wanted me to call the police and get an Amber Alert going. And I'm like, he's got to be around here somewhere. So I get off the phone, and before I call the police, I sit down in my big chair because I'm going to think for a little bit. And so I had, you know, had my lazy boy, and I sit down. And it's then that I noticed something that I couldn't see when I was standing up. When I was sitting down, I was looking around the room, and I noticed that the sofa cushions were about that much higher than they usually are. Instead of being flat, there was a little peak there. Not a big one, just this much. So I get up and I walk over to the sofa and I pull the cushions up, and there's Christopher, there's Matthew, all curled up, sound asleep. He buried himself in the cushions and took a nap. And I don't want to embarrass him, but he still kind of sleeps that way today. He's a burrower. You know, he likes to get under stuff when he's asleep. So I could call Erica back and say, he who was lost is now found. And when Erica got home, she still gave me a dirty look because I scared her. But anyway, we've all been there. And no one wants to be in the situation where they cannot find their child. So for Mary and Joseph, because they'd already traveled a day, it took another day to return. And they did not find him until the third day because obviously if they travel a day, then they're going back for a day. By the time they get back to Jerusalem, it's dark. They can't really look around. And so after three days, I can imagine their worry had turned into desperation. Their anger was reaching infuriation. And we parents all know how it feels when you tell our kids to do something, to be somewhere at some time, and they don't do it. And that's probably what they were thinking, even though they didn't realize that Jesus was doing the work of his father. Not of Joseph, his stepfather, but his father. And so they went to the temple and found him there. And Luke tells us he was in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. And Luke tells us a lot there in these few words. You know, if you've been coming to our Advent services each uh, Wednesday here back in December, you'll remember this was our second Advent service, but I, I emphasize something different then, that Jesus knew he was God when he was 12, but we're looking at this differently today, a different angle here. But Luke tells us a lot here because in Jesus' day, the teachers whether it was in the synagogue or rabbinical school or whatever, the teachers would sit and the students would stand or sit on the ground or the floor. The exact opposite of what we do. Because I'm up here standing, you're all sitting. When you went to school, the teacher stood, you sat at your desk. They did it the exact opposite. It would be the teacher who would be sitting and the students would be standing. And it says here that Jesus was sitting with the teachers. And Luke added, everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. And to the amazement of everyone, Jesus was both teacher and student at the age of 12. And to the astonishment of his parents, he was oblivious to the fact that they were so worried about him and not being able to find him. And when Mary asked him why he'd done this, he asked another question in return. And you know the question, he said. Why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I would be in my father's house? And then in his own way, Luke tells us that Mary and Joseph didn't understand everything they knew about that. Now, I recognize that there are some people that will try and argue that Jesus did a, a wrong thing here and, and that he shouldn't have stayed behind. But he was doing what God wanted what his heavenly Father wanted. And God rarely does what is humanly expected. Have you ever thought about that? How often God does things differently than we would do them? 
You know, the Magi did not find Jesus in the king's palace at Jerusalem. The angels did not make the first announcement to a bunch of theologians at a seminary. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. The Father did not retaliate when his son was humiliated and tortured and executed on a cross. And Jesus didn't stay dead. But fortunately, we don't have to understand everything about Jesus to believe in him and receive eternal life from him. The 12-year-old Jesus reminds us that it's not necessary, nor is it possible, to predict the astounding acts of an unpredictable God. We do not have to understand everything we know about Jesus to invite others to join us here and to, to, to join us into a warm and joy-filled relationship with Him. And maybe the most amazing and ununderstandable thing of all is that He did all of this for us. Because Jesus had a nice, cozy spot in heaven. But instead, he came here and lived a peasant's life and lived among us and took the punishment for our sins. And he died for us. And he rose for us. And he gives us the blessings he won for us. We don't have to understand it. We just know it's true. So today I'm here to tell you, we can be okay with not understanding everything we know about that. In the name of Jesus, amen. And may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding may keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. At this time we will stand and confess our faith. This morning we use the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you that on this day you have brought us here together to be gathered around your word and sacrament. As we see Jesus in the temple so long ago, he knew the importance of being in your house to worship you and to be around your word and sacraments, and we are thankful that we can do that here today. Lead us and guide us in this new year that we would be here in your house regularly to avail ourselves of the gifts you have here for us. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, in the gospel here today, you remind us that it's okay that we not understand everything we know about you. But we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit given to us through your word, through baptism, through the Lord's Supper, that we do know what you have done for us, that you sent your son Jesus to die and rise for us to take away our sins. Lord, in your mercy. Your Heavenly Father, this morning we pray for our country. We pray for all those who lead us, whether it's... Uh, uh, our president or our governors, our legislatures or our courts, we ask you to give them wisdom to rule rightly, justly, and according to your will and that they would seek to do your will. We also ask you to be with and protect all those in our military. And this morning we pray for Thomas, Chris, Preston, and Evan, Cannon, Teresa, David, and Maya, Grant, Chris, David, and John, Ben, and Debbie, Seth, and Vanessa, Kendon, Christian, and Matthew. 
Lord, in your mercy. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we also gather together today to pray for all those who are in need of your comfort, your healing, um, and for uh, all other needs. Uh, we ask you to pray for all those, or we ask you to be with and bless and heal all those who are in our prayer list here this morning. We also offer special emphasis for Jamie March, who is in the hospital, Aubrey Titler, who remains in the hospital, and we pray for all of those that we know who are suffering from COVID or the flu or other viruses. We now take a moment and pray silently in our hearts for all those that we know to be in need of your grace, your mercy, your presence this morning. Lord, in your mercy. Your Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gifts of your sacrament and that in a few moments we'll be able to partake of your Son's true body and blood uh, present in this bread and wine. We, are also we also recognize that we don't understand everything we know about that. But we thank you for these and all the blessings you give to us. And these things that we pray, we pray in your name. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For in the mystery of the Word made flesh, you have given us a new revelation of your glory, that seeing you in the person of your Son, we may know and love those things which are not seen. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you've had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us to do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. seated for our distribution. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus given on the cross for you. Take and drink the true blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. Now this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus give you comfort and strength. Go in peace with joy knowing that Jesus died for you. He rose again for you and your sins are forgiven. Amen. We now stand to sing the post-communion canticle, Thank the Lord.
give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. You may be seated for our closing hymn. That concludes our public worship together here this morning. Uh, Bible class will be starting up here in about 17 minutes, give or take, uh, maybe a couple minutes late. Um, so for those of you watching online and wanting to stay, join us for Bible class, we'll see you about 9.30. God be with you and bless you this week. <laughs>